Well, what a privilege to sing those words this morning. And if Christ did not hold us fast, then we would not be held at all. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, the passage that was read earlier. Uh, We're going to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit's help because I just realized all my notes are at home. (laughs) What do you do? You know those dreams you have when you're like, a kid and you wake up, you know, in a panic, you think, oh, I'm glad that will never happen. Just did. So there you go. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. I might as well just admit it, so uh, rather than try and fake it, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and I just do thank you, uh, Father, for your precious word. I thank you so much, uh, Lord, for the truths uh, that are in it. We thank you, Father, for Uh, this day of worship, this time of worship, and uh, Lord, I pray that you just have your way in our service this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I might just grab, I got an idea, modern technology, hey? That's all right, we can cut this out of the uh, live stream. There we go. Boom. Boom. All right. Well, this morning we uh, finish off our three-part series that we've been doing on the church. It's been a little bit of a mini-series as we've taken a break between Revelation and next week we'll be looking, beginning our series in the book of Ephesians, which will be exciting. And uh, we've been talking about the three purposes of the church, worship, fellowship, as we looked at last week, and This week, we're looking at the topic of evangelism. Now, when we talk about the church, what are we talking about? I think that's important for us to clarify. Primarily, when the Bible uses the word church, it's referring to those those who have received the gospel, the redeemed people of God. Now, certainly we understand and know that as Paul writes his letters, various letters to various churches in the New Testament, that he's also aware that there are those who are part of the gathering of those people who may be gathering with the people, but they are actually not truly born again. And he often offers warnings and calls out to them about the assurance and the necessity for them to uh, ensure that they are truly in the faith. But when we speak of the church, what is the purpose of the redeemed people of God we have talked about it in three ways. Our, one of our purposes is to worship. That's upward. Uh, we come to gather and we worship the Lord. We worship God corporately. We also worship God individually and within our families. Then last week we looked at the aspect of fellowship. That's inward, that when we come together, but not only when we come together, but we are to minister to one another. We are to love one another. We are to serve one another. We to our exhort one another. We are to care for one another. We are to have a ministry to the people that are a part of our assembly or our church, the people of God. And today we're going to look at the last of these responsibilities, and that is our responsibility to the world or outward. What are we to do in the world that we live in? Okay, upward, inward, and outward. Now, I would say that every time we gather together regularly, that all three of these aspects should be on full display. We ought to be worshiping God. We ought to be fellowshipping and encouraging one another, which is why we encourage you to stay afterwards and to edify and be edified as you fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ and to participate in other aspects of the church's life so that you can grow in your faith and be strengthened and to strengthen others. 
But also, even when we gather, we are to be evangelistic. The gospel is to be proclaimed. It should be sung, it should be seen, and it should be spoken. We should sing the gospel. We should see the gospel as we celebrate the Lord's table and whenever we have baptisms. We should see the gospel's uh, impact in the lives of those around us. And certainly the gospel should be spoken through sermon and through conversation. Because we always must be aware that even though many of us come regularly, that there is a strong possibility that amongst us are people who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel is to be proclaimed. Uh, but when we scatter from this place, and I love the way that, that uh, uh, Dean so wonderfully put it in describing the book of Acts, uh, that the, the church, after it received uh, its commission from the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it scattered throughout all the world. And so we, we gather here every Sunday to worship and fellowship and preach the gospel but when we go from this place, we scatter into the world. You go into your workplaces, you go into your neighborhoods, you go into your sporting teams, you go into your communities, and we have a responsibility. We have a calling. We have a purpose in this world. Uh, Jesus put it this way to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 15, when he says to them, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Jesus described his disciples as lights that are to shine and display the glories of Christ to a dark world. And the reality is, is that the darker the world is, the brighter the light will shine. The more that you will stand out the more that people will see you and notice you and hear you, the more that you will testify of the Lord Jesus Christ if we are fulfilling God's commands to us. So this is what God calls us to do. We are to be evangelistic. We are to be outward focused as well as upward and inward. And when a church embodies and embraces all three of those callings and responsibilities, then we are functioning the way that God designed us and called us to, to function. Uh, there's oftentimes an emphasis that may be placed in churches on worship, and that's good, but maybe they lack in their fellowship or their evangelism. There are some that focus heavily on evangelism, but they don't think deeply or, or thoughtfully about the aspects of worship. There are some that are very inward focused. We all focus on our fellowship and, and, and uh, we never allow outsiders in. You know, we, we, we kind of, you know, they can come in, but it's going to take them a lot to, to actually kind of get in. We don't think evangelistically. Well, all three of these are the purposes of the people of God. Upward, inward, outward. So, when we think about this aspect of evangelism, and again, these three messages are kind of topical sermons. Normally, what, and this is what we'll do next week, is we preach expositionally or verse by verse or passage by passage through a book. Uh, these last three have been more topical sermons uh, as we address these three issues. But when I think about the aspect of evangelism or the church in evangelism, five thoughts came to my mind. First of all is that evangelism is a mandate. Evangelism is a mandate. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28. It's a command of God. Matthew chapter 28, uh, very well-known passage known as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus comes forth to them and speaks to them, and he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Evangelism is a, is a mandate, it's a mission that God has given to his people. Uh, prior to Christ's ascension, he, he gives them essentially 
Uh, he gives us our marching orders, if you would. This is his final command to the church before he is taken up into glory. And the final command to his disciples is to go. Go where? Go anywhere. Go into all the world. There's no boundaries. There's no restrictions. Uh, there's no border closures, if you would, uh, to the proclamation of the gospel. You are to take this message and you are to go into all the world and you are to make disciples. Mark's gospel says literally you are to preach the gospel. You are to proclaim the message of the gospel. You are to go. And so in that moment, Christ is telling the people of God, the church, that your focus, while it is to be upward and inward, is also to be outward you are to be looking, going, praying, seeking, searching, serving, supporting those who go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are to be an evangelistic people. This would be a quite a unique uh, declaration to a bunch of Jews because in, in the Old Testament, while the, the, Isra the people of God in Israel were definitely to be evangelistic in the sense that they were to be a light to the Gentiles, they weren't commanded to go. <laughs> they were commanded to stay. And they liked to stay. They loved their land and their home and their temple and their, and their sacrifices and their traditions. And, and, and that's what they wanted, wasn't it? Uh, they, they wanted to stay. Uh, they wanted Christ to restore the kingdom glory of Israel. Jesus says, your job now is to go. Go into all the world. In other words, there is no boundaries, there is no nation, there is no tribe, there is no people group, there is no language that does not need to hear the message of the gospel. Go into all the world and make disciples. This is a, a mandate and a mission that God has commanded us to do. Uh, the passage that we read earlier in Acts chapter 13 highlights this reality, and you can read all about Paul's missionary journeys throughout the book of Acts as him and his companions literally go into the, the places that they can and take the gospel for the very first time to the Jews and to the Gentiles and all of these cities. You can read church history and find about all the other disciples and where they went to in various parts of the, the known world at that time and how the gospel th spread throughout the ages. But as we read earlier in Acts chapter 13, we see that the apostle Paul and Barnabas, they go into the, the, the synagogue and preach the gospel to the Jews. And then the Gentiles beg that their words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Man, I'd love to have those people in our church, wouldn't you? Please preach more, you know. Uh, they beg to hear. And so then they come back the next week and they begin to preach the gospel again. And many people are persuaded. But there's opposition. There's pushback. There's anger. And they begin to oppose Paul and, and, uh, and Barnabas. And they begin to antagonize them and oppress them and, and forbid them. And yet, what does it say that Paul and Barnabas then grew bold? It strengthened them. They had a mandate from God, a mandate from heaven. And as you read in the, in the book of Acts, there are many places where you see the word of God going forth and fruit being born and people being saved, but you also find that there is harsh opposition, arrests, persecution, death, all sorts of things happen to the people of God, and yet they continue in their proclamation of the gospel. We read in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, uh, that when Peter and John are forbidden to preach the gospel, what do they say to their detractors? They say, we cannot but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. You know, when we think of the idea that evangelism is a mandate, normally we think of mandates or commands as kind of like being told to do something we may not necessarily want to do. And we have to do it. We're compelled to do it. We, we're forced to do it. That's kind of the way we think of a mandate. I want you to think of it that way. It's the mission, if you would, of the church. And it wasn't like the disciples were being forced to do something they didn't want to do. 
They were doing something they couldn't help but do. We cannot but speak of the things that we have seen or heard. You can throw us in prison. You can persecute us. You can beat us. You can ridicule us. You can cast us out of the synagogue. You can even threaten us with death. But we have a mission. And we have a calling. And this is not being done out of compulsion. Nor is it being done because if we do enough of this works, we will enter or gain some sort of favor with God and enter into heaven. They could not but speak of the things that they have seen or heard. It's a good challenge for us, isn't it? Can we but not speak of the things that have taken place in our lives? Even though evangelism is an act of obedience, it's not an act, it ought not to be an act of, of compulsion or, or hard obedience. It ought to act as a delight to fulfill the commission that God has given to his people. So the gospel is to be preached to every nation. And you see this is what's going to happen at the end game. As we've already looked in Revelation, that at the end, at the, end in the, at the throne of God, there will be people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Because the gospel will have reached to those people. The gospel, evangelism, is first of all a mandate, but not only is is evangelism a mandate, but evangelism is a message. We are to go, but we are to go and what? Preach the gospel. That is the message of evangelism. We are to preach the gospel. That is the message that the church is to be focused on. That is our calling. That is our commission. We are to preach the gospel. And it's interesting to note that the word gospel and the word evangelism come from the the same Greek word, euangelion. It's the good news. It's the good news that goes into all the world. You see, the gospel is not just simply a bunch of good advice. Every religion can offer you some degree of good advice, but it is only the gospel that is good news. It is good news that Jesus Christ has come into this world, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, uh, died as our substitute, conquered death, rose again, and and defeated everything that, that needed to be defeated and calls us to repent and believe. And upon faith in Jesus Christ, we are granted eternal life. It is the good news of the gospel that we are called to preach. Throughout church history, however, what we have seen is that sadly, what often happens is that the church begins to deviate from this message. It focuses on other aspects of society. It becomes political. It becomes more interested in social issues. It becomes a, a, uh, a club of doing socially good things. We water down the gospel to make it more palatable to the unbeliever's ear. We stop talking about sin. We stop defining sin. We stop calling people to repent and believe. And what happens is that sadly the church eventually begins to lose its salt and its savor and its light in the world. We no longer have a message that the world needs to hear. We're just simply a group of people gathering together regularly for some sort of social gathering or to provide some sort of uh, assistance for our mental health. And that's not what the church is supposed to be. The church is called to preach the gospel. And yes, there are times that we engage the world in in various aspects of, uh, of society, and we ought to do so, but we do so with the primary purpose of declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Churches have begun orphanages and hospitals and and all sorts of things, and all of those are well and good so long as they serve the purpose of proclaiming Christ to a lost and a dying world. Otherwise, we've lost our message. So the church must remain on mission, and we must remain on message. We must never deviate from the message of the gospel. What is this message? It's a message which, as we said, uh, is the good news of the gospel, but it begins with bad news. And the bad news is, is that all of us are sinners. All of us have sinned in thought, word, deed, and intent. And we are separated from a holy God who created us, 
uh, uh, in the beginning, and we are under his authority, but we have rebelled against him. We are sinners by nature, and we are sinners by choice. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son to pay the penalty for our sin, died as a substitute in our place, took upon himself the wrath that was deserved for us, bore it upon his shoulders, took it to the grave, rose again and conquered death. And he calls upon you to repent of your sin, turn to Christ and believe and trust in him. Paul puts it beautifully in 1 Corinthians. He says, for the message of the cross, that's our message. He says, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And may it be ever said, as long as Emmanuel Baptist Church exists, that it could be said of us that we preach Christ. That when you come here on a Sunday morning, wherever we open the Scriptures to, that we preach Christ and Him crucified. May we ever stay on mission and on message. Not only is evangelism a mandate and a message, but evangelism also has a method Evangelism has a method. Now, if you walk into the average Christian bookstore and go into the evangelism section, you will find all kinds of gurus and evangelism experts and people describing the best way to reach the lost from contextualizing the message to how to present the gospel in this particular order and uh, how to answer people's questions and how to motivate them and move them and all those sorts of things to try to get them to believe. Some of those things are helpful, but the Bible declares that there is actually a tried and true and biblical method of evangelism. Specific ways, first of all, preaching and proclaiming. I know this isn't maybe a newsflash to us, But the Bible makes it clear that evangelism is primarily done through speaking. There was a clever saying that kind of arose. I don't know where it came from, uh, but it kind of caught on in Christian circles for a while, and it sounds clever. The saying is, you know, preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words. In other words, people should just see your life And that should be enough for them to understand the gospel. Now, certainly, people should see our lives, and it shouldn't contradict our message. But I would like to change it to this saying, preach the gospel. You must use words. We must proclaim the message. We must tell others This is what we see in the New Testament. Nobody received Christ without hearing the word of God. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In our workplaces, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods, it's all well and good and we ought to display the gospel in how we live. But eventually, the person must hear. Think of the way that you first heard Someone said something. Someone gave you something. Someone talked with you. Even if it was your parents or a pastor or a friend at work, somebody gathered up the courage to ask you, to challenge you, to talk to you, to to question you, to, to present the message of the gospel faithfully. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The gospel must be preached. It must be proclaimed. Now, we can do this, again, through sermons. We can do this through giving gospel tracts. We can do this through street preaching. We can do this through one-on-one evangelism and, and talking with people. We can do this by conversations. We can do this by gathering and allowing people to come into our homes and having conversations with them. But we must proclaim 
the gospel. Second of all, not only is the gospel to be pre- pre- preached and proclaimed, but it needs to be portrayed. So, we ought to speak the gospel. But at the same time, the gospel is a message that must be seen in our lives. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, following on from Jesus' description that you ought to be the light of the world, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now again, we have to speak the gospel. However, a message declared by a person who does not portray the message that it is conveying is a hypocrite. And has there never been more damage to the proclamation of the gospel than those who often are standing up the front proclaiming and calling people to believe a message that they don't believe and follow themselves. It causes irreparable damage. It causes shame to be brought upon the name of Christ. But the mandate is not just simply for the pastor or the preacher up the front. By all means, we have a a higher responsibility, but it's for you as well. How we live, how we display the beauty of the gospel, how do we, trans, how, how do we uh, 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 portray the, the way that the gospel has transformed our lives, that only comes as we are gradually transformed by the word of the living God. We pre- preach the gospel, we portray the gospel. Now, is there skill involved? Sure, sometimes. Sure, there is. Are there people with specific gifts of evangelism? I believe so. I mean, there are some people who just have a a way about it. But in terms of all of us are called to tell others of the message of Christ. Evangelism has a method. Fourthly, evangelism has a, a means or it has a power to it. What's the power in evangelism? What is it that actually reaches into the heart of a sinner and convinces and converts them to understand and respond in repentance and faith? Well, some say it's the skill of the evangelist or the skill of the preacher. Now, by all means, we ought to increase our skills and seek to develop our gifts. While there are some, as I said, who have the gift of evangelism, anyone, however, with the genuine gift of evangelism must also recognize that the means or the power does not come from the skill of their tongue. But the power that comes in evangelism comes from three things. First of all, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one who opens the eyes of the blind sinner so that they can recognize their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, again, kind of drawing off that great commission, before Jesus is ascended up into heaven, he tells his disciples, uh, he says, but you soon shall receive power, authority, uh, sorry, power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in Samaria, and in Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus says, in order to do my will of going into all the world, you need power. And it doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit. He is the one who enables you to say the gospel, to speak the gospel to your colleagues. He is the one who opens the hearts and the eyes of the blind sinner so that he may, he may come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we are burdened, to share the gospel with a friend, the best thing you can do in that moment is pray. Offer up one of those silent prayers to God. Lord, help me. Help me speak boldly and clearly and carefully. And we see that, don't we? We see the transformation of the disciples as this Holy Spirit comes upon them in Pentecost. I mean, who would have thought that out of all of Jesus' disciples, it was Peter. Peter. I mean, the guy who, who always seemed to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, the guy who, who jumped out of the boat and lost faith and started drowning, the guy who literally denied Christ a few chapters earlier, he's the first one who stands in the temple and proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. 
That's the influence and the transforming work of regeneration and the Holy Spirit in the life of Peter. God transforms this man to be a powerful preacher. The Holy Spirit is, first of all, the power, one of the powers of, of evangelism. Second of all, it's the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses the Holy Word of God in connection with one another so that people may believe. In Acts chapter 13, verse 49, where we were earlier, and maybe you're still there, it's very clear. Uh, it says in verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. What is it that people need to hear? They need to hear the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God uses his Holy Spirit and his holy word to bring people to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech. In other words, I wasn't just a clever orator. He said, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul says, the power did not come from my excellent communication skills. I get the impression that Paul as a speaker was not quite as dynamic as Paul the writer. He speaks of a guy by the name of Apollos who was an excellent speaker, a gifted teacher, a powerful man of God. But Paul kind of describes him as speech, which is very plain, very ordinary, wasn't maybe necessarily a crafted master. He was a, a student of the law by far, but in terms of his oratory skills, maybe perhaps not the greatest speaker. Paul says it's not the point. The point is, is that I came to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Not only do we see God using the Holy Spirit, we see God using His Word in evangelism, but He also uses the servants of God. You see, God has commanded that the way the gospel goes forth is the Holy Spirit uses His Word in the mouthpieces of people. 1 Corinthians 2, 3, Paul again tells the Corinthians that he speaks of his work with them a very pagan and uh, rebellious people. But he says to them, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul is the servant of God devoted to the, to the proclamation of the gospel. He says, I, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. You ever felt like that when trying to share the gospel with someone? It's a lot of weakness maybe, a lot of fear, a lot of trembling. I was with you in all of these moments. I gave my life so that you might know Christ. We see the servants of God being used all through the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas here as they boldly proclaim the word of God. You can add another one here, but I would also say that persecution is also a means that God uses to advance the gospel. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? The world thinks that if we persecute Christians enough, they'll shut up and stop teaching the gospel. But it actually goes the opposite. Now, granted, there are times when persecution becomes so harsh that the church leaves, the people of God leaves. I was actually reading a testimony, just uh, an article just the other week. Uh, I think it was put out by Grace to You, maybe, or it was someone mentioned on there. As we've seen in the Ukraine, as there's been a mass departure of people as they've fled the nation, what's happened is that a lot of Christians have had to leave. But there's testimonies as, as they're leaving and as they're going into other countries and settling in refugee camps and things, what are they doing? They're preaching the gospel. And people are coming to Christ. And so God uses the fires of persecution to fan the flame of the Word of God. And you see this here in the book of Acts, that the, the, the Jews come down hard on Paul and Barnabas. And what does it say? It says they grew bold. They grew bold, courageous. And they said it was necessary that the Word of God should be spoken to you first. First. 
And then it says uh, that after this persecution, it says the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up by devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. What did they do? They shook off the dust from off their feet and came to Iconium. What did they do there? Preach the gospel again. What does it say? And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that odd? Being persecuted and filled with joy at the same time? Rejoicing that they could suffer like their Savior? Evangelism has a power to it. Then lastly, evangelism has a motivation. Why? It's something we ought to always ask, isn't it? It's something we ask often when we're told to do something, even as children. Our parents command us to do something, and usually the first word out of the mouth of the child is, why? What's my motivation, you know? Why should I do this? You say, well, it's a command, and that's true. We should obey God. But what ought to be the motivation for sharing the gospel with the lost? And the answer that I came up with is our motivation is love. Why? Because this is God's motive. For God so loved that He gave. But God demonstrated His love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The motivation of Christians to take the gospel into the world ought to be out of Love, love for Christ and love for sinners. It ought not to just be declared that we were right and they are wrong. It ought not to be for the sake of building an empire here on earth or building our church for the sake of building our church and getting more people in it. The motivation ought to be love. And while the world will not see this necessarily, Because when we call out and preach the gospel unadulterated, unwatered down, and we call things sin that the world does not call sin, they will say, you are hateful, you are bigoted, you are angry, you think you're always right. Just like the response that we see all through the book of Acts, many people will push back. They'll say, "You're, you're hating me. And our answer ought to be, no, I I am doing the most loving thing I possibly can. Because the reality is, if you die outside of Christ, you will spend eternity under the judgment and wrath of God in a place called hell. And I would rather risk offending you in a small way now than being too scared to share the gospel with you. Our motive must always be love. And I understand that it seems like sometimes no matter how lovingly you portray the message, people will still respond in hostility. That's fine. Because that's not our responsibility. That's God's responsibility. God is the one responsible for saving sinners. Our responsibility is for preaching the gospel. For sharing the gospel. As I said, our concept of love is telling the truth, proclaiming the truth that Christ died for sinners. The world's concept of love is tolerance, do as you please, and tell no one otherwise. What is love? It's the willingness to sacrifice for the sake of others. And I often ask myself this, as someone who honestly struggles with fear of man and the approval of men. Am I willing to sacrifice my friendship, my popularity, my acceptance, my good relationship with my neighbors? Because am I willing to tell them the truth? 
Because this is the reality that, again, while we are not ultimately responsible for people going to hell, we are responsible to make sure that they have to step over the gospel in order to get there. That they have to have heard so that they can either reject or accept. Paul and Barnabas were not responsible for those who hated them and drove them out, but they were responsible to preach the gospel to everyone regardless of the response that they got. So the church has been given this mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are to preach it here in our services and our ministries. When we scatter from this place, we are to be good witnesses and testimonies of the Lord Jesus Christ by how we live, but also what we say. We do this trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Word and His sovereign plan and will for our lives as we submit ourselves to His plan and to His purposes, and we do this out of a motivation of love. That even if the response we get back is hatred, just like it was for the Lord Jesus Christ, the most loving person ever, but they hated Him because He told them the truth. And our, the servant is not above His master. If they hated Him, they will hate us. But that's okay. For our Father and our citizenship is in heaven. God is sovereign in evangelism. He is working. He is saving those. He is calling people to repentance and faith. He is calling people to believe on Him. He has not finished. The church is still on this mission. And He has called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And may this be the testimony of Emmanuel Baptist Church, that we worship God, that we fellowship with one another, and that when we scatter, we take the gospel into the world that God has placed us in. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We do thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Father, for uh, the truth that it is. We thank you so much for uh, all that you have done for us. Uh, Father, we just do pray uh, Lord, that you would strengthen your people, strengthen my faith and my courage to take the gospel to those whom you have placed in my path, to never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray most importantly, if there's someone here this morning who does not believe, who is in their sin, may they know what Christ has done, and may they come to you in faith. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.